I'm very happy to see a large audience. And when I was invited here to speak to you about my career journey, well, it's been a very checkered career that I've had. And I hope some of the anecdotes or the life lessons that I can share with you today can be meaningful. OK, let's start from the very beginning, a very good place to start. I was born in a post-partition household. They moved to India. They moved to Mumbai, then known as Bombay. So Bombay still stays in my memory. I lived in a wonderful suburb of Mumbai. And that suburb was surrounded. It was a wooded suburb. It had schools, gardens, white spaces. So I grew up in that green atmosphere. But more important was that where did I live there? I lived in a place, I don't know, you're all Delhiites, but it's a very famous lane called the Hollywood Lane of the yesteryears. And why is it called the Hollywood Lane? Because that's a lane where the industry, the Bollywood film industry actually had their moorings. Prithviraj Kapoor and his family, many such actors of that forgotten era lived there. And we all lived like a large family. And every time you step out, into the gully, as we called it. It was a Punjabi gully. We had to say namaste to every elder when you cross the street. But then I think those are the values you learn very young in age. You move on, you get on to school. And I was very fortunate to have my own parents as role models. I had a mother. She was a teacher in those days of maths and science in Sindh when no lady was allowed or no woman was allowed to step out and work. So teaching was the only profession that she could at least be allowed to do. And she was also a very independent lady and in those days. That's what I hear. She always believed that for me, education is her top priority. Whatever I do in life, education should always be the first step for everything that I do. And I had a very soft-spoken father who was very spiritual in his attitude. And he taught me another value, which I had less of, is patience. Be patient. Don't jump the gun. Be patient. And every time, it helped me manage the pitfalls in my career as I grew. I think those were two role models which even today, as they are not in this world, I hold dear to me and has helped me to be the person that I am today. So as a young student, went to school, very fiercely independent. I was a very shy, gawky, tall, called an ugly duckling at that point in time, and a backbencher. I still remember my school teacher. I used to be a naughty girl. I used to speak at the time when others wouldn't listen, but she heard me and she told me, stand up. And she said, say sorry. So I said, sorry. She said, not one inch in your bone looks sorry. So you have to give that body language as well. So I learned that also early in age, that your body language speaks volumes. So please look at what you say and how you match it with your body language small lessons that you learn, and they stay with you. School was fun. You went out to the new world. You wanted to go to college. But Mumbai is a place at that time, Bombay, which was very difficult to live in, cost of living coming from a humble background. What I took with me from my parents' teachings was the value for education, and spirituality, which actually taught me patience. I think that's a very valuable lesson, which I mentioned earlier. College happened, and I said I don't want to be a burden for my family, large family. Everybody is on, its own, on their own. So I decided, after three months of college, good fun, I want to do more. So I switched to Morning College. I went on to major in economics. I didn't 
compromise on my studies. But I was very fortunate that I got a job after many arduous rounds of uh, interviews in a very large manufacturing conglomerate. It was an international organization, a global organization. I was taking my first nervous steps into an unknown world. And mind you, that world had top class engineers, top class MBAs, and the best processes of manufacturing in those days. And it still holds that position today. And I said, here I am. I need to find my space. So very early, I learned my next lesson in life. Find your space, be assertive, but at the same time, be diplomatic about it. Don't do things that can upset others. Say the same thing in a very polite way. Don't hurt anybody's feelings. I think that's another lesson that I learned very early in age. When we are young, we want to do many things. We sometimes don't realize what we say. But I think the teachings of my father at that time taught me a lot of patience. And, but you be assertive. And assertive in the right way. Soon enough, this was my first stepping stone into an unknown organization, but I learned quickly. And I said, let me continue my education. I did my graduation, my post-graduation with this organization. And I got an opportunity to get into a supervisory role. And when I went for the interview, they said, you're up against engineers, MBAs. How are you going to deal with this job? It's meant for them. I said, give me an opportunity. So I think that opportunity helped me because they said, six months, prove yourself. If you're successful, you're there, or you go back to your old job. I took the plunge. I was very fortunate that I had this very mature, fatherly boss who saw that there's this young girl, let me take her under my wing. He taught me how to manage expectations company was large, and then you're starting your career at a very, at a senior level at that, that point in time. And he also taught me not only to manage expectations, but also manage conflict. Because that comes with any kind of work that you do in a large organization, and you have to learn that quick. That how do you manage expectations and how do you manage conflict? He was a very supportive boss. I continued. It was a great tenure of more than eight years. And what he always used to quip, used to say, there's a good salesperson and there's a bad salesperson. And you luckily fall in the first category. So I said, OK, great. I'm learning as I go along. Wonderful innings with this organization. But then there comes a time when you want to choose your life partner. He sits sitting quietly behind. And I must thank him for being such a supportive life partner. Then you want to raise a family. I had a child, a daughter, a beautiful daughter. And I had to take a difficult decision to quit my job. So I quit my job, but I have no regrets even till today. And my daughter's very proud of that fact. And then I moved on. I said, what do I do? I've got a baby. I'm, everything is settled, but I need to do something. I was restless. So I said, let me try my hand at something which I'm not very familiar with, but a friend just prodded me. And I realized that at some point you discover your latent potential. You want to see what you can achieve. You pivot and you pursue. And that probably helped me in my next avatar of my career. And I became a creative, freelance creative consultant. And I was very successful there. I had my own production unit. I used to do a lot of production work for large advertising agencies at a time when you didn't have individuals doing it. There were large production houses. But they probably liked the way I worked and the relationships that I built with them. And I remember one such episode, which has stayed in my memory for some reason. 
One of the largest agency called me for a meeting. We've got our boss coming from the US. You have to come at this time, at this hour. I said, this is a little tough for me. You've given me less than 24 hours. I'm not able to arrange somebody to look after my child. And she was just six months old at that time. So I said, never mind, Roma, calm down. Take your baby with you, six month old baby. So I had this lovely bassinet which was presented to me. I said, now I can use it. And I took her along for the meeting, Right, drove right into town. And the lady who had called me for that meeting was rather rude. She says, you can't bring your baby for a meeting. I've got my seniors who's, who are going to talk to you. Little did I realize that at the back, the gentleman and the lady who had come down from the US to have this meeting with me because there was a very critical launch of a product that they were wanting to talk to me about. And you won't believe they were so apologetic. They in fact ticked off that lady in private, I'm told. We went through that meeting. Luckily for me, baby slept through that meeting. No distractions, no disturbances. But that stayed with me and I was very thankful for their consideration. And then as my career grew, for the next three decades, there was never a time I wouldn't take the opportunity to invite them and collaborate with me. And they worked with me for three decades. Small act of kindness stayed with me. And they got an opportunity to work with me closely. And they were not the same people, but they were, an organization that I respected for what they did to me when I needed them. So I think these small acts of kindness do help and you should keep that in mind. You progress, daughter grew up, I could jump back to my career, which was very strange that I was able to do that seamlessly, not easy for women to get back to work. Nowadays you have many IT organizations inviting women come back to work, you've taken a break, we will retrain you. You have to retrain yourself, you have to be relevant. Don't just sit back with your education. You have to learn, you have to relearn, and don't feel shy about it at any point in time. I said to myself that if I cease to learn even today, then I'm not doing the right thing for myself or for my uh, stakeholders that I deal with. So even today, even just the five minutes I spent with y'all, I learned something. I was talking to one of the students and what she shared with me, it will stay in my memory. And it will be something that I will possibly share on another occasion. But that's very important. And we were just talking that attention to detail today seems to be missing. We must have attention to detail, especially in a career that you all are embarking on. That's going to be the cornerstone of your success. Please be careful, mindful, and pay attention to detail, which I do, and I think possibly it has helped me in my career growth and how I moved careers, pivoted careers, and done what I had to do. Moving on, I think, with my husband's transferable job, I had to move states. But each time I didn't stop and say, or dig my heels and say, I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna do this job, no. I said, let me find out what the outside world is about. I'd never stepped out of Mumbai. Okay, I have to go to different states. My husband has a good job. Let me tag along and let me see what that offers me. And each time that I took a career change, I only grew. I grew professionally. I grew my circle of friends because you're dealing with so many people in different cultures. Even in India, we have different cultures and you need to assimilate. And that's what I did. And I think we made the best of friends across the country. And I grew and I sometimes tell these colleagues, ex-colleagues of mine, they're over three decades, that you're my co-travelers, and you all have been part of my circle of influence. And they continue to be part of my circle of influence. And to develop that circle of influence, you have to take time to know people, get to know what they want, 
and then appreciate what they do and help them when you can. So I guess that's what I've been doing as much as I can because my mother had taught me that, that help people if you're in a position to help. Stop, do that. Don't get so uh, you know, happy with where you are or the power that you have or what you're doing. I think that reflection always held me in good stead. Again, there was another change. My husband decided to move on to a new country from culture, from the States. I had to go to a first world country, which was Norway. And when I reached there, I said, I must understand this culture, assimilate, because my husband was very busy in his uh, very high profile job. I had a lovely place. I said, okay, let me first enjoy the countryside, smell the roses, take a walk, drive around. When you have to get a driving license there, it's not an easy job, I can tell you. But we did that because then you're mobile, you could do what you want. And I think the culture over there, luckily English is their business language. I could really converse with them very easily. And I made the best of friends there until today they are friends. And I got another opportunity, two opportunities, in fact. Uh, the Isaac Norwegian chapter reached out to me. They're saying many IT professionals are coming here. They're not able to assimilate. They're not able to kind of find their bearings. I said, bring them on. Let me share with them what I have learned over here over a period of time because we were there for three years. And my house suddenly became an open house. When Ashok would walk in, he said, who are these people <laughs> sitting and having a great chat with my wife? But I think that was very important for them to get small tips how to adjust, how to live in a country. It's a first world country. And how they can kind of grow their careers there. And I think that was a great learning for me itself. It was a great example of reverse mentoring. I found that I could learn from them new technologies, new tools, and I was amazed that they could just walk in with that kind of confidence and possibly not have that, uh, uh, what should I say, elegance, but they had that fire in their belly to kind of succeed. And maybe they need a little bit of polishing, which we were just discussing, is very important. And possibly that's the small tips I gave them. And they are very successful IT professionals today in that country. I progressed. I got a chance. At that point in time, there was uh, Sri Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who was the uh, then ambassador to Norway. And he introduced me to a lady who was the MD of an e-commerce portal. I knew nothing about it, but I guess I was a proud Indian. And she said, I need to develop some Indian products for the Norwegians to travel to India. And I guess being a proud Indian, that got me the assignment. She's still a very dear friend of mine. And what I learned there was that you have to understand their culture. Don't force your culture onto them. Let them learn what you have and what you can offer to them. And I think the Norwegians loved it. What we did, we did a gig at the main central station. And we had all the Norwegian girls and boys dancing Bhangra to Bollywood songs. And people got very excited. What is India? Can we visit India? This was a time a couple of uh, decades back. And I think these things really help you grow. You become, you have a global mindset. You're open to learning. You're open to seeing what the world is offering you. And that kind of helped me come back to India and get a global job as a head of communications for an automotive and tractor major. In fact, I remember one small anecdote that I met a Norwegian manager whom I was working with for a learning and development project. And he said, do you have uh, snakes and elephants on the road when you walk? And that was a time India was booming. You know, the economy was really booming. And I was rather amused, but then I explained to him. And he said, you dress like us, but you're very exotic. What he was trying to say is my color, but he didn't know how to say it. 
I said, well, thank you. There's no difference. We're all global now. And we're living in a global village. And I guess with these kind of experiences, you learn yourself too. Went on, came back to India. And mind you, if you all remember, I said I was a shy girl and I wouldn't talk. And here I am. I'm talking. And I'm talking as the head of communications for this organization because that was something which I learned over a period of time, to be articulate to express, don't hide your emotions, express it. There's nothing wrong. So I did that. And I started telling a friend here, what am I going to tell your people? What happens if I get stage fright? I said, never mind. I think that's something I can handle. I think that gave me a chance. The company was rebranding. It was looking at repositioning its brand, its legacy brand a very ethical company, and I got a chance to do and innovate communications for them. I also got a chance to learn that what this company is all about. And I must say the legacy I left after a decade was of getting communications to be a strategic function, a global function, getting a seat on the high table. I think that was a high point in my career, and I think all my uh, colleagues in the fraternity do admire that, that now they've got a chance to be there. Maybe I set that ball rolling for them by becoming one of the top management members and contributing to the business goals. Communication just doesn't work in isolation. You have to align it to the business goals of the organization that you belong to. That commitment has to be there and you have to learn the business. So I guess I went back to the gentleman who had given me the first opportunity in the IT company. And I said, I can't do this job. I was determined not to take that. I was enjoying my marketing uh, space. I said, I can't deal with journalists. I'm blunt, I'm candid. He said, that's your strength. You're credible, you know the business. Don't fight shy of it. State the facts and you will succeed. I think he had more faith in me than I had in myself during that time. And I never looked back. That was a choice by destiny and has taken me thus far. Went on, I think, coming back. I said, now I've done everything. Let me hang up my boots. No, that doesn't work for you. People decide for you. So I was called by the chairman of a oil and gas major, very regulated industry. He said in Hindi to me, he's a, he's a man of the masses. Roma, I need you to do something about my brand. I said, I'll try, but it's a tough job. Your brand has a lot of negatives, which I'll have to reposition. So I'm giving you a free hand. You do how you want to do. I said, you will have to change as a leader. Are you prepared to do that? And he said, yes, and I must admire that trait in him that he didn't mind. He said, I'll change the way I talk, the way I say things, and I'll follow what you say. I still remember my earlier chairman of the automotive major, whenever a journalist came to him with a question, he was to ask the boss. Only if she allows me to answer, will I answer. So you know, people give you that respect. Your profession gets that respect. And I think in this company, like you mentioned in my profile, we worked towards social license to operate, to make sure that sustainability is high on the agenda. Change management was happening in the organization. We had one of the big four consulting companies and we transitioned and transformed the brand and looked at the ESG goals. Because today, even in any profession, the, the global warming is at our door. We have to understand climate impact. We have to ensure that the kind of work we do or what we leave behind, it has to help the environment, help the future generations. So you have to make sure that you're working towards a circular economy. You're looking at reusing and making sure that things, the materials and products can be regenerated. And also today you're seeing India is, is actually driving that discussion. Companies are looking at their ESG goals very seriously. They're all the time monitoring their, their carbon footprint and taking net zero goals. 
I think that is something all of you should understand that that's the world you're stepping into. It's a different world. Society has evolved, things have changed. You really need to push the envelope and you really need to reinvent yourself. You need to realign your thinking towards sustainable living because that's what I learned in Norway, that every youth was educated that you must look at sustainable living and a progressive country like Norway did it. And because they're an oil rich company, they do impact the environment, but they minimized it right then. I'm talking about two decades back, three decades back. I think these are lessons to learn. Went through this organization, which was transforming for good. It transformed and I said, now it's time to hang up my boots. Enough of the corporate world. But you know, in my earlier days, I used to, as a student, go to a handicapped school, go there, see the children with their disability, with the smiles on their faces, how they were coping with it. And I said, I must volunteer. I must give back to society what society gave to me, an opportunity to excel. I struggled in my job. I learned, relearned, unlearned many a times. And I think that is something that I felt I should give back. I was very fortunate to get an opportunity with a nonprofit. They said, would you help us? I said, on one ground that I will, I'll become your pro bono CEO. Now I don't need anything. <laughs> Even in my earlier avatar, from a leader, I became an enabler, I became a mentor. I have empowered many teams who are now future leaders, who were future leaders and are now our young leaders. And they all still consider me their mentor and I'm very grateful to that. And I think today, doing what I'm doing, hearing the, uh, I mean, helping the hearing impaired, and they are talented, they're cricketers. They play by the ICC format. In fact, I wish they can be in the main team of ours. They would do well sometimes from all our current cricketers. The, the joy, the, the kind of feeling that you get of fulfillment when you, when you interact with them, when you communicate. Now for a communicator, that's the biggest challenge, that they can't hear me, they can't speak to me, but they can communicate so well through their sounds of silence and their unspoken words. I can tell you, I have tears in my eyes each time. I, I still feel very overwhelmed talking about them. They're such wonderful human beings. They have such an acute sense which has developed because possibly they have some disability. So they, they acquire other senses, which is much more, um, you know, it's more acute than what we would, uh, you know, have in a normal, as a normal person. And I always say to myself that you must have humor in life, you must have fun, but at the same time, not at the cost of self-discipline or hard work. There are no free lunches in life. You've got to understand that. So I think that's been my little journey and I'm enjoying what I'm doing today. And I always say that just don't dream your life, live your dream, as long as you don't have poverty of imagination. That's what I'm here today to share with you. Thank you very much for being such a good audience. <laughs>